Hello everyone, welcome back to Rolling Solo. My name is Adam Smith and we are going to continue our showcase of Solomon Kane from Mythic Games here on the channel. If you haven't checked out my unboxing video or my setup video, I will have a link to that in the top right hand corner where you can check those out to get an idea as to how we got to where we are right now. So without further ado, let's go ahead and read some narrative around chapter 1a within the booklet right here for Rattle of Bones. The Cleft Skull Inn. Solomon Kane's long stride devours the miles as shadows lengthen over the Black Forest. He walks a quiet, lonely trail, though some miles back he gained a companion of the road, Gaston L'Armon, a dandy swordsman. Night shrouds the forest and their thoughts turn to shelter, food, and rest. Ahead, a light twinkles through the trees, and they soon find themselves before a long, low, rambling building of heavy logs. A tavern. A sign creaks, swinging in the slight breeze. It depicts a cleft skull. This place hath a foreboding aspect, meseemeth. Cain mutters darkly. Laarman ignores the Puritan's gloomy observation and calls out, Landlord Ho! The door swings open and a bearded face peers out. The owner of the face steps back and motions his guest to enter with a grudging gesture, it seems. Within, a candle gleams on a table and a fire smolders in the hearth. Food and wine are served, after which the landlord leads the weary travelers to their chamber. Next, let's go ahead and reveal the discovery card as indicated at the bottom of this chapter's page. We'll reveal D200. Ominous feeling. Something is very wrong. The place, the atmosphere, Solomon must inquire further into the mystery. This new discovery card, now that it's been revealed, remains in play as stated, and if we slot a die in that matches the icon, and we will be going over those icons shortly, then if we have that icon in this slot, we're going to go ahead and increase our danger on our stat tracker, and then we're going to add one darkness card to the bottom of the pile that we built over here, which currently has two in it. And as I mentioned in my setup video, the darkness deck, remember, is a timer. Once this deck runs out, it's going to move right to the outcome of the particular chapter. So in this case, in order to be successful, we need to start placing light in order to illuminate Solomon Kane's path before the darkness runs out. So just so you guys can see this up close, the objective is to illuminate Solomon's path. We're going to be going ahead and trying to place as many of these light tokens over top of these slots on this booklet and the aim here is to try and get three or more of these tokens in place before the darkness cards run out and we have to move to the outcome. If we happen to have three light at the bare minimum on these spots on this booklet like so, that is enough to have considered that we have illuminated Solomon Kane's path and then we can move and proceed to 2A. If we for some reason don't have enough, like two or less, then things are very dark and are only going to likely get tougher on us as we proceed to 2B. This is going to present a general branch in the story path based on whether you can illuminate his path or not. So now let's talk quickly about Providence. This is the virtue that I'm controlling in solo mode while playing through this. Again, this is the one virtue that is not used when played cooperatively and only used in solo mode. It is a very powerful virtue and streamlines the experience for solo players. So as you can see here, we have three different actions we can take right on the dashboard for Providence. We also have a left hand and a right hand. Each of them have a card currently and we will be able to, whether we use them or not, discard these cards in order to put other cards into play to give us different options later on based on whatever we're trying to accomplish in a given story or scene. So let's focus on the three actions on the board itself. We have Integrity, Valor, and Providence. We'll talk about the one on the far right first. That one's called Providence. It has three die slots, and each of them have a question mark inside of them, meaning when we roll our dice at the beginning of our turn, we can slot any three dice into those positions, and as long as they're in there, we can then resolve that particular action, which would be to place Providence on the board, or we could move her one. Now, we're playing a chapter right now that's labeled as 
a story. So there is no place to place Providence at all. There's no environment for Providence to interact with. So that action's not going to be of use to us inside of this story chapter. Valor here is in the same boat because this is all about talking, fighting, or exploring. Again, something you would do in a scene, but nothing here at this point in time we can use to interact with on that action. So we move to integrity where we can either move or place light. And we know just based on what we looked at in terms of illuminating Solomon Cain's path, that placing light is definitely something we want to do. So now understanding this, let's go through a hypothetical roll here in terms of how my action could be resolved. So let's say I rolled these three dice, I got these three results, and I was quite happy to match up the icons in order to take the benefit of being able to place the light that I really want to do. So this would satisfy that. I place those two dice in either of their slots. As long as they match icon-wise, I then discard the dice and I get to take advantage of what's below, which is placing that light. Now when I do place the light, I can put it on the illumination of Solomon Cain's path in the first position and working my way up to try and get three or more before the darkness deck runs out or I could choose to actually put it on Providence in one of these three locations to gain benefits. And these benefits are going to impact, in most cases, a scene more so than a story. But the one that would help quite a bit right now in the story portion would be an extra die, allowing me to roll an extra die at the beginning of every turn. So instead of the typical three, I could roll four. So you might want to go after that and take advantage of this with Providence in order to get that extra die because even if you don't use all the dice that you've rolled in a given turn, you are able to put some of them up here in reserve slots as long as you've got space for them, of course, in order to keep them for an upcoming round to have an even bigger turn. So now let's talk about the mitigation of dice rolling in this game. How do you manage the fact that when you roll dice, you're not always going to get the icons that you're looking for? Well, in this game, there's a number of ways. So the first thing we'll do is throw in an example of rolling these icons. And let's say I'm actually gunning to go ahead and try and pull this integrity off again. Based on what I have right here, I can still make this happen. Now, I showed you moments ago you need the icons to match. This right here is called a faith symbol and it is on two sides of every die. If you flip it over, it's the exact same result in the opposite side. And that is a wild. And you are allowed to use in a single action, so each of these are a single action, you can use one of the slots as a wild. So you can pick which one you want to use it in, but you cannot use two wilds or three wilds or more inside the same action, if that makes sense. So I could not go ahead, grab another wild and go, yep, this is going to work for me. Can't do that. So one you can cover, you can't do two. But this is enough right here to satisfy being able to pull that action off. The next thing you have as an option, if you didn't want to go that route, is as soon as you roll your dice, you have these two things of available to you. Either a re-roll, which allows you to pick one die up and re-roll that die if you just don't like what it is, or you can flip the die, which is quite interesting. And as I mentioned with the wild one, if you flip a wild, you get a wild. So that's not going to help you. But on the other ones, it can help you because you could go, for instance, from a pain to a determination, or you could go from a fear to bravery, for instance. So there is some changes there that you can make on top of using wilds, Plus the fact you have a reserved area over here that if I didn't make use of all the dice that I had, so if I reset back to what I had at the start of the example, and I went ahead and I used this wild in here, and I used this pain one right here, I have one extra die that I don't plan on using anywhere. I can place this in the reserve, and on a future turn, this is another way you can get around some bad dice rolling, is having dice ready to be used in a future round. So now that you have the gist in terms of the dice rolling and the mitigation side of things, and we'll see a lot of this as I move through my playthrough, let's talk about the left hand first. I've got finesse in there. I chose this straight out of my hand and slotted it in during the setup video. This one is great because it only needs two icons in order to pull it off. Uh, the icon in question there is a fear, and we need a pain. If we can pull both of those off, then we get to add or remove one darkness card from the game. So we can actually 
speed up the timer to try to have the chapter end quicker, or if we think we need more time to put out more light in front of Solomon, then we definitely can add more darkness cards in. You could, if you wanted to, not bother trying to illuminate Solomon's path and just purposely try to burn the darkness deck, but obviously that's going to take you down a dark, dark road. In my right hand slot is a perfect example of a situation where you could end up using a faith icon as well as using a faith icon for a wild and it would be a legal play. If I happen to have for the first example a pain die in that one and of course it actually calls for faith so I just place that in like this that satisfies things. Now let's say hypothetically I didn't have the pain die but I had rolled another faith. I would be able Able to place this into this slot because it's considered a wild in this scenario and this one is not considered a wild because it's matching the fact that it's faith. What I would gain from activating courtesy is minus one on danger, the stat track, or I could gain a light. It's worth noting if you ever fill in the left hand or right hand or even both with dice on your turn once you've activated those abilities on this card or the other card off screen on the left hand side, they're discarded. Once they're used, they go into the discard pile. They have to come back around into your hand and then be replaced back into your left and right hand to be used again in the future. Just so you guys can see the other cards that are currently in my hand that could eventually make their way into the left or right hand slots near my character board, I have Elegance and Dignity. Elegance is certainly a good one because it allows me to place two light, but I need four dice to pull it off, which means I'm going to need to add that plus one die advantage for Providence using light at some point, or I could potentially save some dice in the reserve in order to build up to paying for this. And the other one on the right hand side is Dignity, and you'll see you'll be able to impact and actually boost up some of your stats, but sometimes there's going to be a change in another stat. For instance, we're going to go ahead and actually increase danger in order to activate, or I should say boost up strength, compassion, or clarity. Now that we have the rules down for dice rolling, we're going to move right into a game round so you can actually see this in action. Just so you're aware, Virtue goes first, in other words, Providence in this case, and then it's going to jump over to the Darkness and then back to the Virtue. So in this case, being that I'm playing solo, it'll always be Providence and it'll always be the Darkness flip-flopping their turns. Let's go ahead and roll three dice and see how this pans out and what options we could potentially go after. All right, so we got ourselves a couple fear results and we have one faith, which could be used as a wild as well. Now, do I want to flip any of these or not? Or do I want to reroll a single die? Now, looking at my options here, I'm pretty happy with what I've got. I may not want to touch anything because, as you can see, I could potentially place one of these dice up here in order to trigger the ominous feeling. This will boost up my danger and add a darkness card, but that's something that I want. I want additional time to try and get the light uh, down on the board that I need to. And then I could use these two dice, and I could use this one here, and I could use this as a wild in this place right here to add another darkness card. So the great news is I can get two darkness cards into the deck but only take one actual hit on the stack track for danger. So it is worth mentioning that once you've placed all your dice down, you get to choose which order these things are resolved in. That may matter for certain cards and certain abilities, and other times it won't matter at all, like in this case. So I'm just going to go ahead and choose Ominous Feeling to resolve first, take the die off. We're going to increase our danger by one in the track over there. It's going to go from a three to a four. I am now going to go ahead and add that new darkness card, and it goes to the bottom of the current darkness deck. Now I'm going to go ahead and trigger Finesse, so I'll remove these two dice from the equation. This was in a hand slot, so this card is now discarded and will go away, and that hand slot is now open. You'll see how that fills later on, and it states I can add or remove a Darkness card. I'll certainly be adding one, and it will go to the bottom of the deck. So not bad overall. It didn't place any light anywhere, which is something we really want to focus on, but I did buy myself a decent amount of time. I now have four cards in this deck. 
Now we have a decision to make around the left hand card and the right hand card. You'll see the left hand card is gone because I already used it, threw it up in the discard pile up there. But if I hadn't have used this card, I have a choice at this point in my turn to either discard this card, I could choose to discard this card, or I could even discard both of them if I found that any of them were no good for what I was trying to accomplish in the next round. So this is really important to note, it's not just what you use that after you use it is discarded but right afterwards when you're done resolving your actions you can then take a look at the actions you have left in your hands which are on the left and right hand side and go I don't want this one and you can ditch it if you want to and then you can take a look at the cards in your hand the ones that you're actually holding the other cards and decide whether you want to slot them into one of these two positions and you may want to do that based on your strategy for me personally this card is exactly what I want to see this allows me to place light and there's no reason for me to discard this right now and in terms of this side I've already discarded it so I just need to populate this back so I simply go ahead and choose a card from hand that I want to place in that slot. So I've chosen to go ahead and place Elegance because, again, this gives me another option in terms of placing a lot of light really quick. However, I'm going to have to do some saving to be able to make use of that. Now that I only have one card in my hand, I'm going to have to go ahead and draw back up until I have two. Interrogation is the new card that I picked up. You can see here it'll cost me some compassion as well as three other dice in order to talk for or I could potentially gain two mercy. Now you're likely wondering what mercy actually is, so we'll just take a look at the cloud over here on the right hand side. We have three mercy cubes in white and three luck cubes in green. Now anytime you gain mercy or gain luck, you're simply going to take it from the pool that's above the cloud and literally drop it on the cloud tile, letting you know that you now have this available to use. The same can be said about the blessing tile stack that's right beside them. Each mercy cube can be used instead of one of the dice requirements for an action. More than one mercy cube can be used on a single action and they can be used in addition to wild dice. So they're pretty powerful. They cannot though replace stat costs and mercy is not removed from the cloud at the end of each chapter. So you can accumulate a bunch of mercy and carry it forward inside the storybook chapter to chapter. Now the green cubes are luck, as I mentioned, and by discarding a luck cube once they're on the cloud and they're owned by the Virtue player, you can ignore the first number drawn and draw a new one. This is going to help you big time during skill checks. This is something we'll talk about later on, but again, same as Mercy, it's not going to be removed from the cloud when you move or end a chapter. Providence's turn is complete. Let's now go ahead and flip a darkness card to begin the darkness turn. When we take a look at these cards, there's going to be a number of different sections on the card. And when you're doing a story chapter, you're only going to care about the top section, the one with the book icon. The other ones below it are only for scenes. They're going to be for moving characters in and around the environment, interacting with different things. And also at the very bottom, there is a spawn icon that relates to a certain spawn as to where something or someone is going to appear but in this case here we have just a story based chapter so we're only going to be reducing our clarity unfortunately by one our clarity began at five and has been knocked back to four so as you can see, just from one Virtue turn and one Darkness turn, we've already impacted the Darkness track and we've already touched the Clarity track and both of them in not good ways. So you can see that the impact of the story chapters will definitely have an impact on the actual narrative as well as you eventually moving into scenes and the ripple effects of those choices, decisions, and how you play through those narrative portions will certainly come out in the wash. So it's very interesting. We're going to go ahead and roll another three dice here for Providence and see what we can do. We need to start generating some light real quick. So we got ourselves a courage, or I should say bravery, pain, and determination. I've gone ahead and paid for integrity and also placed my additional die I don't want to use in this given round in the reserve. This is going to help me towards saving for elegance, which later I'll be able to go ahead and place too light if I can build up towards it. And another way to build up dice is to try to gain more of them. And that's exactly what I do. So by paying for integrity with these two dice, I'll remove these two dice right now, 
placing the light and instead of putting this on the storybook to move the path up, I'm instead going to place this right here on Providence to give me an additional die going into my next round. And that may cost me because again, I'm not illuminating Solomon Kane's path here. So it's this may be a bad idea. We'll see. So right off the top here at the very beginning of the card is all we care about for story mode. It says, oh my gosh, minus one clarity, minus one strength or minus one compassion. So I do get a decision here, but one of these is dropping by one. Now, in a situation like we had on the last Darkness card where it just straight up said that I'm losing one clarity, I didn't have much of a choice as to what actual stat was impacted. Whereas with this one, it's going to impact either clarity, strength, or compassion. So one of the top three trackers has to go back by one. So what you want to focus on when you have a choice is the modifier values in the same horizontal row as the title of the track. So for strength, for instance, it runs from minus two all the way up to plus three. And it's the same for clarity and compassion passion so you want to look at where the marker is look at what's above it and see what you could be losing by shuffling that marker down one position so in this case if i move the strength from a seven to a six i lose the plus one that doesn't sound nice to me i don't like it if i move clarity from where it is to the third position I'm going to be at a minus one. I also don't like that, but compassion is in the eighth position. And if I move it to seven, there's no impact on the modification or that value. So I'm happy with that move and we'll move it down by one. More dice always equals more fun, especially when we've got one in the reserve to use as well. Let's see what we get. Oh, this could be a very, very good turn. Now, this was a really tough decision and quite a bit of a gamble here because I have two darkness cards left. So I'll have one that'll get pulled right after I'm done resolving this turn and then I'll have one more turn and I need to get at least three light on. So what I'm trying to do is attempt a really big three light placement over two rounds. So what I'm doing here is I filled these two dice into these slots that match to activate for light. That is gonna place one light on the track up on chapter one A. So the path is beginning to illuminate for Solomon Kane. With my goal being to hopefully get to three as soon as possible. And even if you illuminate it up to three or more, there are chances inside the darkness deck that can mess with your light placement, including removing light, as well as messing with reserved dice. We've resolved this action, and that's why those three reserve dice up there are so risky, because if I happen to pull a darkness card that says we lose all dice in the reserved area, that's going to be a little painful, and I'm going to have to bank on a roll that's going to work perfectly to place two light right here, uh, and that would get me up to the three that I need just before time expires, and then I'd have to also hope that the last darkness card doesn't mess with light or remove light from the game. If it does remove light, I do have the opportunity to potentially take it off of Providence and still uh, actually successfully have a bright outcome for Solomon's path. We'll see how this plays out. It's also worth noting that I'm not choosing to discard any cards in my left or right hand or even both because I'm quite happy with the options they both present. All right, let's hope that this one pans out for us. Off the top, we have an increase in danger. Okay, I can handle that plus one on the danger track. Danger is currently sitting in position four and now it's gonna move up to five. You'll notice that the danger has shifted up to a, another position and just below the danger track, you'll notice some icons, those depict shadows. And I will talk to you more about how that is gonna impact things when we get to scenes in the game. But one other thing that you need to always watch for in regards to this stat track across all of these is if you ever take danger beyond what the track can handle. In other words, on the danger track, if you go to 11, Solomon Kane is immediately defeated and overwhelmed. If his compassion is reduced all the way down till it removes off the board to zero, you also lose. And the same for clarity and strength. So strength, clarity, and compassion, things get bad when you're going to the left of the track. For danger, it's obviously much worse going to the right of the track. 
We're back to Providence's turn. Let's go ahead and roll four dice, hoping to see some good results here. And of course, we always have a reroll or a flip. And of course, those only can be used on the dice you're currently rolling, not the ones that are sitting in the reserve. Oh, very interesting. This actually works out quite well. So we ended up getting uh, two faith and two determination. I'm going to flip one of those determination over to the opposite side. So we also have a pain. I think that's the best move. This is what I've chosen to do. So as you can see here, I have a number of these dice down here. So let's talk about how this works. So taking a look at the icons inside of it, we've got some that are saying question mark, which basically means you can use them at whatever face they are. So these are considered faith dice. So I'm using them as faith. So these are okay to have two of them on the card. Where it gets dicey is if I decide to go ahead and try and use multiple of the face symbols as a wild. That's when the restriction comes in. You can only have two. But here I have this one which covers my bravery. I don't have the one that covers fear. So instead I'll convert this faith to be the only wild on the card which is allowed. And that is going to satisfy that card. Allow me to trigger it placing two light onto Solomon's path. With the two light placed up top, we'll go ahead and discard the card that I used in order to pull it off. It's gone from my hand. I have one more action I can go ahead and do, and that's this one here, so I'll remove these dice. I can move one or place a light. I'll definitely be placing a light, but the struggle I have right now is deciding with one final darkness card left. Do I go ahead and place this light on the path, giving me four total? And if... By chance, this darkness card that's sitting here waiting for me happens to have on the other side of it the removal of one light, I'm safe because if it removes one light, I still have three and that's still considered a bright uh, path or bright outcome so I can move to 2A. If I happen to just leave three light in there and I decide to take, say, for instance, a bonus on Providence to set her up for a future scene, it could be a great benefit to Providence to get her ready but the risk is if something gets removed from here, it can result in a dark path outcome. So I'm gonna go ahead and be a bit risky because I think it's kind of fun to put that risk out there and see if we can get lucky in beefing up Providence and just getting by with the bare minimum for chapter 1A. I also have to decide whether or not I want to remove this courtesy card that I have on the right hand side. For now, I'm happy with it. I haven't used it yet, but I'll leave it there. And I'm gonna go ahead and place something in here from one of the cards in my hand. So I think I'm gonna go ahead and attempt to try to gain some of those mercy cubes at some point. So I'll place this right here. And I've gone ahead and drawn another card into my hand to make sure that I have two after that. This new one here is gonna allow me to fight with a start base stat of four or gain two luck cubes, which it also could be really useful. It is time to determine whether the darkness card is going to do us in or not. Let's find out. All Virtues discard one active action card. That's not bad at all. Now, in previous plays, I have seen Darkness cards come out pretty viciously against the Light, which is the reason I mentioned it. And it's definitely a good heads up for you guys when you're jumping into your first game. Don't always bank on having just three Light to guarantee a bright outcome. Sometimes those Darkness cards, and oftentimes those Darkness cards, are going to come back to bite you. So I have a tough call to make here. I have to decide which of the two cards in hand in terms of the left and right hand here, I want to actually discard because these are my active action cards as it's stated on the darkness card. So which one do I want to get rid of? Probably the one that I need to save the most dice for at this point. I think I'll keep the one over here that can allow me to drop danger down or gain light. That sounds like a good idea. So let's go ahead and discard this card. With the last darkness card revealed and resolved, we're now going to talk about the outcome of the chapter as it's come to its close based on time. So you can see we have three light, which means we're on the bright side of things. A three, four, or five tokens on that track or path would have guaranteed us a bright outcome. Two or less is the dark outcome. But before we move to the next chapter, there's a benefit that comes from actually placing light on this track that I kept from you as we went through this first chapter 
here, but it is worth mentioning because you may want to lean into it a bit. And that is the more light you place on this track, the better benefit you get at the end of the chapter when it resolves. So right now we take a look, I've got three light. We know I'm going down the bright path to 2A, but the rule book also states when you place three light on one of these paths, you're gonna get one modification to one of the stats on the stat tracker board. So that could be a positive move in strength, clarity, or compassion, or even a drop in danger. And if you happen to have four light in this area, you get to make two modifications to those stat tracks. It's whichever one you want, and you could choose to have danger be removed or be reduced, I should say, by two. And if you end up with five light on the track, you can make three modifications. So for me personally, I'm not a big fan of danger creeping up to that next level. The other one I had my eye on was clarity. It's getting close to being in the negatives, which is also something that's not so great. But for now, I think I'm going to try and get the danger level back down by one. So we'll go ahead and just reduce this to four. Kane and Larman follow their silent host down a long dark hull. The stocky broad body of their guide seems to grow and expand in the light of the small candle he carries flickering as it casts a shadow behind him. At a certain door he halts, indicating this is the men's sleeping quarters. Cain and Larman enter, and the host follows to light a candle for them, from the one he carries. He then lurches back the way he came. In the chamber, the two men glance at one another. The only furnishings are a couple of bunks, a chair or two, and a heavy table. Let us see if there is a way to make fast the door, says Cain. I like not the look of mine host. There are racks on the door and jam for a bar, says Gaston, but no bar. We might break up the table and use the pieces as a jam, muses Kane. So as you can see inside of this chapter, special rules section says minus one danger. And this is going to be something you will see pop up and basically you will gain that right away as either a bonus or a penalty based on how you did in the previous chapter. So in this case, because we actually did a good job of illuminating Solomon's path, danger has been reduced an additional point. And this is fantastic news to get us down to three. You can also see that we'll be doing a similar story of illuminating Solomon's path through this portion of the narrative. And we have an outcome again of bright and dark, but remember how much light I get on this thing can really help to modify the stats on the stat tracker. Next up, we have a couple things to set up to move into this chapter. We're going to go ahead and take all of the darkness cards we used from chapter 1A. They get shuffled back inside of the bigger deck of darkness cards, and we draw a brand new two. So you're never going to see the same darkness cards be repeated right back again. So this is always going to keep you on your toes and throw new challenges your way. So I'll go ahead and place the darkness cards right here. We'll also see D200 makes a return and we know that it actually stuck around because the bottom of the card itself here stated that it remains in play. And we also now go ahead and reveal D201. D201 states distrust. I have seen you somewhere before, says Kane, though I cannot now recall where. Kane's eyes deepen as he continues. I am a light sleeper and slumber with a pistol at hand. The Frenchman laughs. I was wondering how Monsieur could handle himself to sleep in a room with a stranger. Ha ha. And you can see down below, we are going to have a change here in compassion of minus one. It states one virtue must change one reserved or donated die to a fear icon. I will be going ahead and reducing my compassion from where it sits at seven down to six, which is going to remove the plus one bonus modifier we would have when using the compassion stat. Down below here, as I mentioned, one virtue's got to change one reserved or donated donated die to a fear and unfortunately I had a really good die sitting in the reserve that is now no longer going to be as useful as it was before so I'll change that to a fear. 
So let's go ahead and start things off with Providence. And you'll note that I don't have anything in my left hand slot at this moment. And that's unfortunate just because of the way the last chapter ended in terms of using cards and getting cards discarded from me based on the darkness cards we ran into. That will happen. There will be times sometimes you are told to remove a card that you have in front of you. And then all of a sudden you go into your next turn and you will not have as many actual options to choose from. That is another way that darkness can mess with you. So we're going to go into this term rolling four dice. We're going to hope to see some good things that we can make use of to put some light down and progress the story. So we got ourselves two determination, a fear, and a faith. That's a pretty good mix. I think what I'm going to do with this roll, I was toying with potentially flipping one here, and I think I will. I'm going to flip this one right here over to the pain side, and that's gonna allow me to use these two in order to use integrity to place some light down. I'm gonna keep these two and place them in my reserve pool. Remember, I'm being pretty brazen with this. There's been a couple times I've had a whole bunch of dice in the reserved area and haven't used them. Um, I'm hoping to make better use of them in the future, but there's always that risk, like I said before, the darkness cards can take away all your reserved dice. So this plan, as nice as it sounds, could go sideways real quick. And now that I'm thinking about it and the fact they only have two darkness cards in the deck before the chapter runs out, I probably need to get some more time in there. So to add another darkness card, the only way that I have the availability to do so is to use the discovery card up here, which I do have a fear die in my reserve. So let's go ahead before I place my dice in there and choose to do this as well. So I will go ahead right now. I'm going to increase my danger by one and add a darkness card to the bottom of the pile. Danger is ticking up up to four. A darkness card has been added to the bottom of this deck, so we now have three. That's good, buying me some more time. And I'm going to resolve this one right here for integrity. This is going to allow me to place a light, and you know exactly where I'm placing this one because I do want to illuminate this path as best I can before time expires. I am happy to keep this card right here, and I don't even have one here, so we'll leave things as they are. But I'm going to go ahead now and play a card from my hand to fill in this empty slot. I'm going to use this one here which requires quite a bit but it could potentially gain me two luck cubes which could be really handy later on i've drawn up a new card that requires four things to be completed three dice and minus one on clarity will allow me to explore at four or draw two blessings and choose one to place on the cloud that could be pretty handy all right darkness what do you have for me this time Minus one on clarity. The darkness really doesn't want me to see what's going on in this situation. Let's see what Providence is capable of doing this turn. All right, we got, oh, that's a nice mix. We got fear, we've got bravery, we have pain, and we have faith as well. And I used some reserve dice in order to make this happen. This is really, really cool. So I was able to actually use my courtesy over here. I ended up keeping this one in the reserve. I didn't have to do any kind of flipping or rerolling. I was pretty happy with what I got. So I went ahead and used these two here to successfully do this one, which is a minus one to danger or one light. I'll definitely be going ahead right now and placing a light up here on the pass so we're up to two now and this can be resolved these dice are removed and this card is now discarded the other hand here i'm gonna have to knock my strength down by one which is okay because i'm currently at a strength of seven so it's not bad i did have a plus one on that and i will lose that plus one but the bonus here is i get to go ahead and gain two luck cubes so there is a price to pay for sure, but I do get to go ahead and add two luck cubes to the cloud. My turn is now done. Both of my hands left and right are empty. So I'm gonna take both cards from my hand and place them in both slots. And I'll have to draw up two. There's only one card here to draw from. So now the discard pile gets reshuffled back in, but I do have to take whatever is still here. So the one card that will be going into my hand is this one right here for resolve. The deck has been reshuffled. We'll draw from the top, see what we get. We have Interrogation. This is the one about talking or gaining some Mercy Cubes. Darkness deck only has two cards left, but that should be just enough time to get me into the light. Hopefully, we'll see. Otherwise, I'm going to have to bide my time a little longer. It states, all virtues discard their right-hand action card. Oh, as soon as I put it out, it is gone. Pretty straightforward. This one is no longer an option. 
Now, based on how things are going right now in terms of the cards I could potentially get light from, I only have the one action here. The cards left and right are not going to do much for me that way. So I could get enough to illuminate the path. But again, remember, it's risky. It's always risky. Those darkness cards are waiting for you to think you're safe at three. Let's roll and see what we can do here. So again, another fantastic spread of dice. Even though I got a lot of great dice there, I didn't really have a drive to do much else. I could have attempted to go after this one here and it is very tempting because I'd be able to boost one of the three, whether it be strength, uh, compassion, or clarity, and my clarity is already in the negatives. So that would have been nice to bump that back up to even zero for a modification on that stat track. But the downside is I'm taking a danger and that's gonna just boost me up to the next level of pain coming my way so i i'm not too sure i'm happy with that trade-off at this point so i'll probably leave it alone i might regret that later but i think i'm going to be able to make this work so let's go ahead cash this in we're going to put one light on the track so we know we have everything we need we're going to go through this last darkness card right now but first before we do so i've no longer have a card in my right slot do i wish to keep this Maybe. I think I'm okay with it for right now, and maybe that will actually be a help to me when we go into the next chapter, depending on what's there. In terms of other options here, I think I'm going to put interrogation into this slot here, because if we happen to move into a scene, this will be good for talking or for gaining uh, mercy cubes, which could be handy. I'm going to draw up another card from the deck to see what I get. This will give me a total of two cards. And courtesy, this is a great one. Um, so this one's gonna allow me to decrease my danger by one, that's huge, or get a light increase. We've seen this one before. Time to move into the darkness and find out whether we escape scot-free or if things go sideways on us. Here we go, last card. No, that's not the one I wanted to see at the very end. Uh, if, and that's the one I was talking about earlier that if it occurs early enough in the deck, that's created for the chapter, you can work around this by using these other cards allow you to add more darkness in and you can work your way back up because a removal of one light is nasty. Now here's the thing, you are not trapped to removing a light from the path. So I don't have to knock this down to two and thus move into a dark outcome. I could, because I've placed light on Providence, knock one of the benefits off of Providence. I don't really want to knock off the plus one die because that's just way too useful. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to knock down Providence's aura size, which basically means she, when she's on the board in a scene, she has an aura around her of one already, including the space she's in. By having the plus one aura size that I'd put on from this light earlier, it made it so that when she sat on the board, she would have a presence two spaces out from where she currently is, including everything within that. So I'm happy removing that for now and making her aura a little less powerful in order to ensure that Solomon's path is illuminated. And because I have three light on the path, I get to make one modification. I'm definitely gonna bump clarity back up and out of the minuses so that I'm a little bit better in that regard. I really don't wanna go through a test where I automatically have a modification of minus one. So based on the bright path for Solomon, we're gonna be proceeding to 3A. Chapter 3A is a scene, as you can see right here, and on the next page we'll see how that scene unfolds as we set it up. First we'll read the narration, and it's called, What Happened Here? Taking the candle with them, they go into the corridor, sensing something more ominous at play. Utter silence reigns, and the small candle twinkles and glimmers, pushing back the dark. Mine host hath neither guests nor servants, mutters Solomon Cain, a strange tavern. What is the name now? These German words come not easily to me. The cleft skull? A bloody name, I faith. They try the rooms next to theirs, but no bar rewards their search. At last they come to the room at the end of the corridor and enter. It is furnished like the rest, save the door is provided with a small bearing opening and fastened from the outside with a heavy bolt, secured at one end to the door jamb. There should be an outer window, but there is not, Kane mutters. Look. The floor is stained darkly and the one bunk hacked to pieces, great splinters torn away. Men have died here, says Kane somberly. 
The special rules for this chapter state that we gain one clarity, so we're actually doing a little bit better than we originally thought. You'll see under the keywords and stats, we have Gaston, and he is considered a seeker and a vandal. So when it shows keywords like that, what you're gonna to wanna to do is reference the back of the rule book for Solomon Kane. It will tell you what a seeker does in this situation in relation to the explorer token that's right beside it, as well as a vandal and what it does with that token. And then down below, you can see once you do a check, which is an explore check on the token, then it's based on your result that you get on that check. You go to specific discovery cards. You'll see this in action and it'll make a lot of sense. The objective for this chapter is to find a door bar and the outcome down below is the result of a number of different things. And the outcome below is the result of purity points and how many of them you get. If we end up getting two, we can proceed to 4A. This is likely the best outcome. Uh, one purity point will get us to 4B, and if other, then 4C. This chapter instructs us to go ahead and create a darkness deck of eight cards. So I've gone ahead and taken the top eight cards off the darkness deck after shuffling the old ones from the prior chapter in, and they are placed right there. So we have a brand new eight, no idea what's inside that deck, and I really don't want to know. Then we have two discovery cards. We need to pull D202 and D206. D202 is a ransacked room. It says the floor is stained darkly, the walls and one bunk are hacked into pieces, great splinters having been torn away. Men have died in here, says Kane somberly. So this is the end of the narrative that we just read. You can see down below it, it states when the last exploration is removed from the board, reveal D209 and discard this card. And this remains in play as well. Gaston was a different type entirely, bedecked with lace and plumes. Although his finery was somewhat stained from travel, he was handsome in a bold way and his restless eyes shifted from side to side, never still an instant. It states down below, whenever Gaston removes an exploration token, he places it onto this card instead. Down below on the card, it states, remains in play until the end of chapter five. And here is the scene that we're gonna be going ahead and building right now. We're gonna need the compass. We're also gonna need two shadows, Gaston up here, Solomon Kane, and we have Courage the Virtue here. Now you're probably wondering, we only have Providence. So you will never see Providence called for in any of these adventure books because Providence is only used in the solo mode. How you would use Providence in this situation is if there's a single virtue being called upon, no matter what, name, in this case Courage, Providence is the one that's going to go into the location that it's pointing to. Very simple. Now if you have multiple virtues that happen to show up in a scene, so say for instance we had Courage and a number of other virtues appearing in different locations, the bonus here for solo players is they get to choose which of all the different virtue positions shown on the setup board they want to have Providence enter in. So I've gone ahead and set up the tiles as depicted in the storybook, all three of them in a row here. We have the compass token. We also have the darkness deck of eight. We have all of the discovery cards called upon in previous chapters that have stayed at the bottom. They remain in play. One of them says it's going to be removed at the end of chapter number five. We're currently in chapter three A right now. So a little ways to go before that one disappears. Next up, let's go ahead and place the spawn tokens. Spawn tokens have been placed. We we have X, Y, and Z. The five explorer tokens as depicted in the setup have now been placed on the tiles. Solomon Kane and Gaston arrive at the scene, as well as some other entities in the scene known as shadows. And of course, Providence also enters the unseen realm in order to defend against the shadows that try to take down Solomon Kane. And that, my friends, is going to set us up for Chapter 3A. Join me when we come back to the playthrough. We'll pick it up exactly where we left it off here, and we'll enter our very first scene within the game together. Thank you guys so much for watching, and as always, keep on rolling solo.